we've seen that the New Testament has revealed to us that at the moment a person is saved, born again, at that moment they are baptized in Holy Spirit. We've also seen that even the New Testament church was aware of that from records like in Acts chapter 10, as well as the fact from records like in Acts chapter 10, Acts 2.38, Romans 10.9 and 10, that you didn't have to be water baptized to be saved. So then why did the first century church continue to water baptize? And there's a real simple answer for that. First of all, it was a really, really well-established tradition. I mean, it started with Moses with the washing ceremonies, 1,500 years. That's a serious tradition. More than that, however, Jesus Christ had said to. After he was crucified and then raised from the dead, remember he met with his disciples in that 40-day period between his resurrection and his ascension, he met with his disciples and he made various statements. One of them is in Acts, uh, Matthew, one of them is in Matthew 28. And in Matthew 28, what does Christ say? Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. And so here in Matthew 28, in this 40 day period, Christ tells his disciples to go and baptize. How do we know it's in water? because that's the only kind of baptism people can do. Only Jesus Christ can baptize in Holy Spirit. All people can do is baptize in water. So when we read in the scripture about people being commanded to baptize or people baptizing, it's always in water because that's all they could do, absolutely. Now, also we have Acts chapter one, verse five. Now Acts chapter one, verse, verse five says, and this is Jesus speaking, because John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with Holy Spirit not many days from now. And for years, I misunderstood this verse. For years, I read the word but in the English, and I said, oh, well, this proves that, that the ba water baptism was out and Holy Spirit baptism was in. And that's what I believed and taught for years based on the English versions. I've now come to believe that wasn't the case. The crack of my dam started when I, as I studied baptism more and more and began to realize, wait a minute, the apostles continued to baptize. Now the apostles were there with Christ, they'd lived with Christ, they knew Christ intimately, and they spoke the language he was speaking. And it's hard for me to believe that he would tell them to stop baptizing, but they would continue to do it. And so I began to question what was going on? What was my understanding? And then as I began to study it more accurately in the Greek, I found out that the word but, it's not really even the word but. It's, uh, if it was going to be but, it would be the Greek word Allah. But it's not, it's the Greek word de. Uh, de, if you want to look it up for yourself, it's Strong's number 1161. It's perhaps the most common preposition in the Greek New Testament. It occurs, <laughs> it occurs more than 2,800 times in the New Testament. That's a lot of times, more than 2,800, which means that if you took the des and sprinkled them evenly over the New Testament, more than one verse in three, <laughs> every, more than every third verse would have a de, would have a de in it. And it can get translated but, it can get translated and, it can get translated now as in uh, now hear me. Not in a temporal sense, but more in, is an intention getting sense. And many times it's just plain old left untranslated. It's simply a, a shift. It's in, indicative that there's going to be a shift and whether that shift should be translated with an and if there's a continuation or a but if there's a contrast. We try to get that from the context. But in this case, if we know that Jesus Christ told the apostles in Matthew 28 to water baptize, putting an emphasis here on the word but and saying, but that's what's in English, is not really the proper way to exegize the scriptures. Uh, if we thought of it in this case as a now or uh, even being untranslated that John baptized with water, now you're going to be baptized in Holy Spirit, Christ is simply putting emphasis on the fact that the disciples are going to continue, they're going to now, there's going to be a change. They're going to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. He's not saying that you have to quit water baptizing, which by the way, is why they didn't. So then we have to, to uh, in fact, I should say this too. It's not even clear from reading Acts and Matthew, which of the two statements Christ made last. 
did Christ say the Matthew statement last or the Acts statement last? It looks at first blush like the Acts statement would be last because that's where his ascension is. But if you read Acts carefully between Acts 1.5 and Acts 1.6, there's a time break. So the scholars really aren't even sure of the two verses, Matthew 28 and, and Acts chapter 1, which are the ones that was the last thing Christ said to his apostles. Uh, we, we don't really even know. In summary then, the reason the apostles continued to baptize was Jesus told them to, and he didn't tell them to quit. So they keep baptizing. Now, we're going to learn later, of course, obviously, when the New Testament starts to be written, when the Apostle Paul begins to get the revelation of the New Testament, then we're going to find out, okay, guys, now, now here's the clarity on the fact that water baptism has been replaced. We're not going to, we, water baptism is not necessary anymore. The reality is now here, baptism in the Holy Spirit. And so it's a legitimate question to ask, why would Christ do that anyway? Why would Christ tell the apostles to baptize if he knew that when the revelation of the New Testament was going to start to be given, he was going to say, okay, water baptism is only a symbol. There's one baptism for the church, and it's the reality of baptism in the Holy Spirit. And to understand that, we have to understand that that was actually the way Christ treated most doctrines. I mean, we need to sit back and think about this for a second. You know, what, what did Christ teach his apostles. It says in Acts chapter 1 that when Christ was raised from the dead, he taught his apostles things about the kingdom of God. But there was a lot of things he didn't teach them, which, by the way, caused some major problems for the first century church. For example, uh, and, and again, in summary then, Jesus didn't treat baptism any differently than he treated other things. What about sacrifices? The daily sacrifice. A sacrifice, say, that a woman would do after she'd had a child. Or the sacrifice, say, that a leper would do. Did Jesus Christ say anything to anybody about the fact that, hey guys, now that I've, I'm resurrected from the dead, the sacrifices thing, uh-uh, don't do that anymore, okay? Let's, let's not do that. No, Christ didn't say anything about it. And, and what, what happened as a result of that? The, particularly the Jewish Christians just continued right on in the law and continued doing sacrifices, absolutely. And we can read in, in Acts chapter 20 more about that later. What about circumcision? Circumcision should have ended. Now the New Testament, you know, the New Testament makes it clear that circumcision is not necessary anymore. And the Apostle Paul had huge fights with people, Christians, Christian brothers who believed that circumcision was still essential. And the New Testament revelation makes it clear. Circumcision is not essential anymore. In fact, Paul is going to write to the Galatians and say, if you've been circumcised, you're fallen from grace. <laughs> think, think of the trouble Paul had city to city, people following after him, you know, that, that believed in circumcision and thought Paul was leading people from the faith, when in reality... Paul was leading people into the faith and into the revelation he'd received from Jesus Christ. And now, think of how much easier it would have been on Paul's life had Christ, maybe maybe even as he's going up, you know, he could have shouted, guys, hey, I forgot to tell you, no more circumcision. I mean, just, just if he'd done something to let people know, think how much easier it would have been on the first century church. What about the separation between Jews and Gentiles? We've already studied Acts 10. Here's Peter, I'm not going in. I've never eaten anything unclean. I won't go into that man's house. What if Jesus had simply, in, in the 40 days that he was with his apostles, said, guys, by the way, no more separation between Jews and Gentiles. We're not doing that anymore. That, it, it's possible that the word of God might have even spread faster in the first century because it was years and years and years before anybody went and talked to a Gentile just because they... They were honoring this separation that was part of the Old Testament. What about food regulations? Paul has to write all that stuff in Romans 14 about food that's clean and unclean and offered idols. When I, when I think of the things that the New Testament makes clear that the early church fought over. Now, the church versus unbelievers? Oh, sure. 
They're going to fight over whether Christ is Messiah. They're going, to, they're going to fight over whether he actually died and raised from the dead, that kind of thing. But if you look at the internal fights in the church over circumcision, over food, over Jews and Gentiles, over sacrifices, if you look at the internal conflicts, how many of them could Christ have cleared up in those 40 days between his resurrection and his ascension? I contend that he could have cleared a boatload of them up. But for some reason, he waited until the revelation of the New Testament itself was given. The Bible never tells us what that reason was, why he waited. But one of the things he waited on was baptism. So he didn't straighten out circumcision or the separation between Jews and Gentiles or all the food regulations. And he didn't separate and he didn't straighten the church out on baptism. It was just one more thing that the people needed to learn. And so, and, and by the way, they were slow in learning it because when the Apostle Paul got the revelation of the New Testament epistles, did the people like James, you know, who's, who's right in there with the apostles, I mean, did, did he just say, look, there's that guy Paul over there. He's getting revelation from Jesus Christ. We need to believe what he's saying. Not at all. They were... They were skitterish about the Apostle Paul. They, you know, this was a man that had killed Christians. This was a man that had not known Christ personally. And all of a sudden he's saying he's talking to Jesus Christ and getting revelation and changing things that have been uh, around since Moses, things that Jesus Christ had spoken of personally. And so they're not going to believe Paul. And that's what happened. They didn't believe Paul, which is another reason that the traditions of the first century church continued on in the church because the church didn't believe Paul. In Acts 21.20, when, when James is talking to Paul, and this is maybe like 57 or 58 AD, we're talking 30 years after Christ has been, has been uh, crucified, 30 years. Uh, Galatians has been written, Romans has been written, Corinthians has been written, Thessalonians has been written. And yet what does James say to Paul? Acts 21, 20, you see, brother, how many thousands of Jews have believed. These are our now Jewish Christians, and all of them are zealous for the law, which tells me they didn't believe a thing that Paul had written in Galatians or Romans. <sighs> how much easier would it have been had Christ simply said, guys, the law, it's, it's done, it's over with, my sacrifice fulfilled all that. But he didn't do it. So why did the early Christians baptize? They baptized because that was the tradition in the church. That's where cr the trajectory that Christ got them started on when they were his disciples. And they continued in spite of the revelation that was given to the Apostle Paul. Now, when we read what James said to Paul in Acts chapter 21, that gives us a real window into the New Testament church, the early church, what was happening, the traditions, and the conflicts between Paul and his writings and the practice of the, of the early church as headed up by James, which, by the way, in many cases became the practice of the Christian church because, as you know, what happened historically was the church pretty much deserted Paul. And this was easier to do then even than it would be now because back then maybe only one in ten people could read the epistles. So let me see. We have what Paul wrote that I can't read, and we have what Jesus did and told us to do, and which one of those contains more weight? Now, what, but me, <laughs> and so obviously people did what Jesus did. But Jesus, on the other hand, from heaven, expects us to realize that he is going to modify what he's taught. For example, he doesn't expect us now to continue animal sacrifices just because he didn't say not to. He doesn't expect us to continue separating ourselves, Jews and Gentiles, where you have the little Jewish churches and the little Gentile Christian churches, you know, the, uh, the, the Jews who become Christians. He doesn't expect us to stay separate and not eat in each other's houses even just because he didn't say to be together. We have to remember that in God's economy, in God's way of doing things, when he gives new revelation, he expects us to follow that new revelation. And the new revelation was the revelation of the church epistles. 
But for years and years and years in the early church, they didn't have that revelation, so they just continued to water baptize. And this then answers the questions that so many people have asked me as I've been teaching this for years, that water baptism is now out. The symbol, water baptism, was replaced by the reality, baptism in the Holy Spirit, and that is where we should be putting our, our time and our emphasis. We should be teaching about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and teaching people to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. People should be speaking in tongues, interpreting tongues, prophesying, you know, walking in the power of the manifestations. And people have said to me, but John, if, if you just look at the early church and, and look at the history, here's Acts chapter 2, verse 38, Peter, repent and be baptized. And he's talking about water. Then Philip in Acts chapter 8 goes to Samaria. And what's he do? He baptizes the people in water, like Acts 8, 12. And then Philip meets with the Ethiopian eunuch in Acts chapter 8, 26 in the following verses. And he baptizes the Ethiopian eunuch in water. And then when Paul is born again, you know, and saved in Acts chapter 9, in verse 18, what happens? Ananias baptizes Paul, even though he knew Paul was already saved. He said, Brother Saul, he walks in, Brother Saul. He knew Saul was a Christian brother, but he still water baptizes him. Why? They were following the only revelation they had at the time was the revelation of Jesus Christ, who said, go and make disciples and baptize them. And then, of course, you've got Acts chapter 10. Peter baptizes Cornelius. Acts chapter 18, the Apostle Paul baptized some people in Corinth, although by then he was beginning to get the revelation from Jesus Christ. And so when he writes back to the Corinthians, he says, I, I baptized Christmas and, and Gaius, and, and I may have baptized some other people for Christ, did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. See, so here was the early start of the revelation to that where Christ is speaking from heaven, saying, guys, that I didn't send you to baptize anymore. I sent you to preach the gospel because people are saved by faith. But by, by the time the New Testament epistle, epistles were written, which again, if they started when we think they did, about 48, BC, 48 AD, that's about 20 years after Christ ascended. And then they, it took until maybe the mid 60s, mid to early 60s before they were completed. Uh, the Apostle Paul maybe finished the prison epistles in 62, 63. So the, peer, the epistles were written over a period of almost 40 years. But during that time period, the tradition of water baptism was firmly established. Our challenge now, let's, re, let's, let's take back what Christ gave. Let's focus on the reality. Let's, let's teach people and talk about the baptism in the Holy Spirit. <music>